Well, hi everyone. Welcome back to part two of my talk about the symmetric and alternating groups. Um, in part one of this uh, two-part series, I had just defined the alternating group for you. It is that subgroup of Sn consisting of all of the even permutations. Uh, even permutation is just an element that can be expressed as a product of an even number of transpositions. Okay? Um, and we talked about the fact that the odd permutations do not form a subgroup at all, right? So we're just focusing on the even ones. So I thought it would be a useful exercise to take a look at S4 again, the 24 elements of S4 here. I'm going to circle the ones that are part of A4. Let's take a look. The identity element, of course, had better be in there. <laughs> okay, that's zero transpositions. The next six elements in this first column here, however, consist of one transposition and one is odd. So those elements are not part of A4. The three at the bottom, however, consist of products of two transpositions, and so those guys are going to be part of A4. Okay, two disjoint transpositions there. Okay. What about this middle column? Well, these are cycles of length 3. You remember my little fun fact from the first part of the video? A cycle of even length is odd, and a cycle of odd length is even. It's backwards, right? Well, these cycles have odd length, which means as permutations in Sn, they are even, which puts them squarely inside of A4, right? A4 is the even permutations. On the other hand, the cycles of length 4 over here are all odd. right? So uh, it's very interesting. Even without doing any uh, brute force calculations, I know that if I multiply any of the things that are circled in blue, I'm going to get something else that's in blue. I have a subgroup here. right? How many elements do I have? 1, 2, 3, 4. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The size of A4 is 12. Anything about that strike you as interesting? By the way, I know that, that some of this uh, maybe is a little heavy. If, it, if you need to pause, uh, rewind, maybe talk to a friend, get back to me and finish the video or ask me a question, definitely feel free to do that. I'm, I'm here to help. I love talking about this stuff. So, so I don't mind. Um, but yeah, there's something very interesting here. Exactly half of the elements of the symmetric group turned out to be even, at least for S4 and A4. A4 is exactly half as big as S4. It turns out that that is, in fact, always the case. The size of An is always one half of the size of Sn. In other words, n factorial divided by 2. Okay. Um, before I prove that, I'm going to explain that in just a moment, but I just want to uh, point out a consequence of that, is that when we're looking at An as a subgroup of Sn, okay, I've already talked about the fact that An is a subgroup of Sn, notice that this is actually a normal subgroup of Sn. And that is, uh, of course, since one of the ways that we come up with a normal subgroup is if we have a subgroup of index 2. The alternating group has index 2 within the symmetric group. And in fact, we can even uh, immediately write down this quotient group, right, mod out by the normal subgroup An, and we know that that's a group of size 2, so it's going to correspond to Z2. Notice that all of the even permutations get mapped into, you know, 0. Right? The identity element here, the identity of this quotient group is the coset An. It gets mapped to 0, while um, the odd permutations are going to get mapped to 1. Okay, so that's... Uh, that's uh, something interesting to note. In fact, one way to prove that 
this is a little bit um, circular reasoning, but you know, once you know that <laughs> an is a normal subgroup of sn, well, you can actually prove this isomorphism using the first isomorphism theorem, and then uh, from there deduce that an is half as big as sn. Let's not do that. Uh, I'm not going to go there. Uh, let's just leave what's on the board kind of at face value. And let me just explain this fact uh, in a more elementary way that doesn't involve any group theory at all. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of, I'm going to draw a picture over here. Here's SN. Somewhere over here is AN. And then somewhere else is the odd permutations. At the moment, I don't really know, I don't know yet that AN is half as big as the whole group SN, so I don't really want to draw it that way to, to be misleading that I know that already. So I just draw a picture kind of like that. I have all the even permutations in AN, and the odd ones are outside of that. But take a look, I'm going to define a function. Now, this is not going to be a homomorphism at all. I'm just going to take a function, and I'm going to take inputs from the alternating group, those would be even permutations, and I'm going to spit out something that is an odd permutation, I'll write odd perms, of Sn. Via, so I'm going to take an even permutation and create an odd permutation out of it. How do I do that? Here's my little secret. I take any sigma that's even, I'm going to add one extra transposition to it. I'm just going to add one more transposition to something that was an even number of transpositions. So now when you add one more to it, you end up with an odd number of transpositions. So the input space and the output space, I hope it makes sense, right? Domain, codomain, it's all legit. Okay. Now, this is not a homomorphism at all, right? It doesn't send the identity element to the identity element, for example. It's not a homomorphism. But I don't really need to convince you of that. All I'm going to do is claim that F is a bijection. You see, if it's a bijection, if F is a bijection, then these two sets have to be the same size. Which means that in my picture over here, AN has to be exactly half of the group SN. Okay, so this is all I have left to show. If I can show this claim, this fact would be, I hope, pretty clear at that point. Okay? And to show that it's a bijection, this is not algebra, this is just set theory. Right? I just have to show f is 1 to 1, for example. Right? So uh, if I assume that f of sigma is equal to f of tau, I'm hoping to convince you that sigma equals tau. Right? So then, let's just check it out. f of sigma is sigma 1, 2. f of tau is tau 1, 2. And what I can do at that point is just take these equalities and write multiply. Let me just use a different color here. I can take this equation and write multiply by 1, 2 again. Oops. Okay. No reason why I can't do that. I can just throw a 1, 2 on the right hand side of both of those expressions. And now the two transposition, the one two cancels with itself, right? Because it's order two. So one two times one two is just e. And look what you have. The sigma equals tau. Just that simple. Why is it one to one? And put me on pause if you need to stop and digest it a little bit more. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just trying not to make too many minutes in this video. So uh, let's suppose I want to show that f is on to. I'm just going to grab something that's uh, odd over here. Let sigma be odd. And I need to find a preimage to it. Well, that means I need to find something that's even right here. 
And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to take my odd sigma and add one transposition to it. It's so clever. All I have to do, what is f of sigma times 1, 2? Well, f of anything is just obtained by taking whatever you plugged in and tacking another 1, 2 onto it. And now the 1, 2's cancel and you end up with sigma again. So it's no accident that um, your sigma, or sorry, that your alternating group is half of your symmetric group. Okay, it's a subgroup of index 2. Okay, I'm going to, we're going to have much more to say about the alternating group later. I have one last thing that I am hoping I have just enough time on this uh, film to tell you about. And that is something called conjugacy in SM. So I'm not going to restrict to the alternating group any longer. I'm just going to focus on SN itself. And it turns out that this is yet another great reason why cycle notation is the way to go when you're thinking about the elements in the symmetric group. When I say conjugacy at SN, of course, I'm talking about doing conjugation. When you're trying to show that a subgroup is a normal subgroup of a group G, right? one of the go-to methods is to just verify that your subgroup is, uh, sorry, that your elements in your subgroup are closed under conjugation, right? So being able to do conjugations is, is a very uh, useful thing. Let me imagine for a minute that I take an element tau that has uh, maybe this kind of a cycle structure. A1, A2, A2. Let's just imagine it's a single cycle of length k. And then I'm just going to take any other element sigma in Sn. And I want to consider the following. What do I get when I calculate this conjugation expression? By the way, I know that a lot of times when we write down these conjugations, we put the inverse on the left side of the element instead of the right side. I, on purpose, I have put the inverse on the right side here. It makes no difference, right? Because um, I could replace sigma with sigma inverse, and then what's on the left is really sigma inverse inverse, right? Um, so it doesn't actually matter which side you put the sigma on and which side you put the inverse of sigma on. For the uh, point I'm going to try to make right now, I want to do it this way. I would like to ask myself, what does this permutation do to the following element? I'm going to imagine I start with sigma of A1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply, remember we go from right to left, I'm going to apply sigma inverse to this element. So what does that give me? Sigma inverse of sigma of A, well that's just A. Sorry, this should be A1, sorry. That just gives me A1. Right? And after doing sigma inverse, now I take A1 and I apply tau to it. Remember, I'm going from right to left over here. So tau of A1 is what I'm going to get. But tau of A1, as you can see, is A2. And now I'm going to take that result and apply the, the last element here, which is just sigma. And of course, that means I'm going to end up with sigma of A2. Do you see what just happened? I started at sigma of A1, I applied this element, which was sigma tau sigma inverse, from right to left, it's this one first, right, sigma inverse, then tau, then sigma, and I ended up at sigma of A2. What I'm saying is, what I'm basically trying to convince you of, is that what is this element here? Well, it's going to take whatever sigma of A1 is, and send it to sigma of A2. <laughs> and if I just follow that same logic again, you know, if tau sends A2 to A3, then sigma tau sigma inverse is going to send sigma of A2 to sigma of A3. And on and on and on, there's going to be no change to that general pattern. We are going to get this expression on the bottom here. 
And the key thing I want you to notice about it is it is the same cycle type as the tau that we started with. Tau is a K cycle, and so is this conjugation of tau. So when you do conjugation in Sn, that element that you sandwich in the middle of your conjugation, it has some cycle structure, some cycle type. And performing this conjugation is going to give you some other element of the same cycle type. Right? It's going to give you something of the same cycle type. In fact, you know exactly what it's going to give you. Because it's just this thing right here. Let me just, maybe up here I can squeeze a little example. Suppose that uh, sigma is, I don't know, 1, 4, 3. That cycle, the cycle 1, 4, 3. And let's take tau to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'll just make something up pretty easily. Okay. By the way, if you have more than one cycle that makes up tau, that's fine. You just apply sigma to each of the cycles that uh, is making up your product tau. But let's just suppose we have a single cycle for tau. Right. So then what is sigma tau sigma inverse? Let's just check it out. Okay. What we do is we simply replace these five numbers with sigma of each of these five numbers. In other words, sigma of 1, sigma of 2, need more room here, sigma of 3, sigma of 4, sigma of 5. If you believe my, my formula down here, that's what you would do. And we can just look up at what sigma does to figure this out. Sigma of 1 is 4. Sigma of 2, well, 2 doesn't show up in sigma, that just means it's fixed, right? Sigma of 3 is 1, sigma of 4 is 3, and the 5 doesn't show up, so sigma of 5 is 5. So, I started with the cycle 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I conjugated by sigma, and I got another cycle that has the same cycle type. So, the cycle types in terms of like how many cycles and which lengths they have, is something that conjugations preserve. And for now, I'm just going to leave that as a sort of a, a, a fun observation. But later, we're going to start talking about conjugacy classes in a group. And studying um, the symmetric group is going to be particularly easy with respect to that, because the conjugacy classes are going to be lined up with the various possible cycle types, right? So, you know, uh, just as a, a final, I'll wrap this up, but, you know, as a final illustration, if we go back to S4 again, we have an identity element, we have all of those transpositions, we have all of those pairs of transpositions, we have all of the three cycles, and we have all of the four cycles. There are five different cycle types. And if I take any one of those five types and start with an element and conjugate that element by anything in, in S4, I'm going to get another element that's in that same camp, that's in that same cycle type. And this is going to be a, a really a uh, great way for us to sort of understand the symmetric group, right, uh, is by breaking it down according to the cycle types. Uh, so, uh, again, I'll just reiterate, we've got to get away from the two-line notation for our permutations. We've got to write them as cycles. Uh, it's been running everywhere through uh, this video and the first part of the video. Uh, and so if you're still uh, trying to wrap your head around the cycle, notation and how cycles work. Uh, now is the time to, to get on top of that. Uh, I'm happy to help you with it. We can practice um, you know, some examples of it together. Uh, just, you just have to let me know. If you're struggling with it, it's fine. Uh, it took me a while to figure it out when I was first learning it. Um, but the, the worst thing to do is to just stay silent about it and hope it's going to go away. <laughs> Cycle notation and the symmetric group are not going to go away. So I, I need everybody to, to work hard to get on top of this, okay? Hopefully what I've said makes reasonable sense. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks for watching my videos, guys. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. We'll do more abstract algebra. Thanks a lot. Take care.